Um, that's Manhattan. Where else would we talk about a talk except if we make it uh, like a Broadway production? So I'm going to talk to you about my career in three acts. Um, the first one is epidemiology and community health. The second one is some time at public health at the national level. And then act three is where I am now at the CUNY School of Medicine. But before I started this journey into research, um, I was actually trained as an undergraduate student at Ithaca College. Um, I was a physical education and health major. Uh, and I was very fortunate because uh, when I student taught, the woman I student taught for retired and suggested I get the teaching job. Um, teaching jobs in those days were extremely rare. I was the only one in my class that got an actual teaching position. So I went on to teach at Lansing Central Schools. I taught high school uh, girls and boys. Um, we did all kinds of lifestyle activities because even though sports were pretty important back then, I always felt like we weren't doing justice to people to stay healthy and to give them the skills to be active for the rest of their lives. I think at that time people thought I was crazy um, because there was a pond in front of the school in the winter time it would freeze so we'd go out and play ice hockey. Uh, there were days where instead of making the girls change their clothes, we would take a walk uh, and just talk and talk about how great it felt to, to move. Uh, but I went into physical education for the hopes that I could convince people to, um, to like being active, to like exercise. Um, and, you know, those of you who um, were, can remember being high school girls or new high school girls, that was the last thing that they wanted to do back then. So I was really kind of frustrated by being able to encourage at a young age people to be active. But I also have a very strong family history of cardiovascular disease. Um, Dr. Michaelick mentioned how many of us get into these fields because people that we know and love have had certain diseases. So I received my master's degree at Cortland, and it was a focus on exercise physiology and cardiac rehab. And again, I was very fortunate. Um, Dr. Mike Lick talked about good luck and, and being in the right place at the right time um, to, to land a position, uh, the only non-nurse in the cardiology group of Western New York's cardiac rehabilitation program. And um, I was really excited because I thought we have all these people, back then 99% men, we had one woman in the program, um, they had heart disease. And the ones that survived it often had surgery. So they had scars from chin to abdomen, down the leg. They were going to listen to every single thing I told them. They were going to be so compliant. Finally, I found my population that was going to be all about living healthy. Well, for a few weeks, a few months, it worked. But then behavior changes became more and more difficult. And just by chance, again, good luck, um, I was seeing a physical therapist myself for a running injury. And she was talking about how she had just defended her dissertation in epidemiology at Roswell Park Cancer Institute. And I had my ear eavesdropping at what she was talking about and learned to, lo and behold, that the University of Buffalo, in conjunction with Roswell Park, had a program uh, in epidemiology. As Dr. Michael Lick said, at the time it was called experimental pathology. So I literally went there to take a couple courses just to learn more about heart disease with the intent of going back to the patients and being a better rehab uh, practitioner. And then I met some pretty interesting people uh, my mentor, who was the first person to come to this program interested in cardiovascular disease. Um, I had the honor and the pleasure of having Dr. Michaelick for Cancer Epi um, and some really great faculty members. And I decided that, you know, maybe this, maybe this really was the career for me. So at this point, I made a transition from working with individuals to not only working with populations, but conducting research in populations. And I was exposed to a variety of different epidemiologic study designs and a number of different methods. Um, and I think, about, I think about that, and I think about that in relation to what you've all done. Um, you know, I still remember Dr. Saxon Graham, who was the chair of our program, and he, he would say to me, he called me Joni Girl, he'd say, you know, when we first started doing this research, it would take us a month to do one chi-square. So we thought about what we were going to do before we did it. We had a hypothesis. We had 
a passion about something we wanted to study. And I heard that in all of you. I heard all of you talk about the things that you actually did. And I don't know if when you're in the throes of that, you recognize what a wonderful experience in your accomplishments. But I hope I'm around when it all hits you and the light bulb goes on exactly what you did this summer. Uh, because nowadays with technology and all these different software packages and massive databases, you don't get that experience. And I really think to be a good scientist, you gotta get down to that shoe leather stuff, collect your own data, find the mistakes, clean the data like people have said. And I was really lucky to do that. I was also really lucky because I was allowed to study my two loves, which was physical activity and, and heart disease. So my dissertation was involved with physical activity and heart disease in primary prevention. And then I was also lucky to work in a clinical trial, the first one in cardiac rehab, and look at the long-term follow-up of if the people in the program actually lived any longer than the people who didn't. Um, that led me to figuring out, you know, maybe everybody didn't go to the program. Did the people who went to the program, who were more compliant, do better than the ones who didn't? From that point, I came to the fork in the road. And like Yogi Bear said, when you come to the fork in the road, take it. So I took it. And I went on to study alcohol drinking pattern and heart disease. And you may wonder, how did she get from physical activity to alcohol? But there were two reasons. One, there was a lot of funding for alcohol. And two, it was the same terminology I was used to, because in drinking pattern, we were looking at frequency, intensity, duration, and type. That was right in the alley of an exercise prescription. So I never thought I would get involved with alcohol, but it was a really smooth transition. From that point, building on the previous work, we started, you can see in the bottom, that's one of my doctoral students and a technologist, we started an ultrasound lab. The ultrasound lab allowed us to look at subclinical markers of heart disease. And by having those biomarkers, we could look at a lot of exposures without waiting for people to have heart attacks, without waiting for people to die. And in one of the roundtable discussions today, there was a really nice talk about mechanisms. No matter what field of epi you're going into, really start to think about the mechanisms. We, we know fruits and vegetables are good for us. You know, we know exercise is good for us, but now the epidemiology is moving more and more to the how and the why. And if you don't have some basic physiological background, you are going to struggle throughout this path. So this ultrasound lab allowed us to look at potential mechanisms of these things. And then I had another great opportunity to start a worksite wellness program in Erie and Niagara counties in western New York, working on work sites, trying to promote people to be more physically active and to eat right. So there were so many supporting actors, um, and you've all thanked so many people today, but your study participants, without them, we are not in business. And I learned very quickly how important they were. Um, for my dissertation, I had to follow people that were interviewed in 1960 in 1989. And I would call people on the telephone, and I can tell you there were nights where I was on the phone for two hours with one participant because that person wanted to talk to me. So without them, there would be no research. Without amazing masters and doctoral students, there would be no research. Uh, we had great research staff, and I was lucky, uh, you can see a group of people uh, that I was fortunate enough to be able to work with. And in epidemiology, this is not something where you're going to be under a microscope doing things by yourself. You need to develop these collaborations. You need to learn from as many different groups as you can. So for me, what did I learn? Do something you love. Keep focused on your research. Present your work at scientific meetings. I heard a lot of you are going. It's great to get the opportunity to experience presenting, but it's even better to hear other people present and make connections that you will keep for the rest of your lives. So go to those meetings, network. Don't be afraid to introduce yourself. Don't be afraid to hand out business cards. Go meet the people that are doing the great work in your field. Um, you heard it yesterday, you'll hear it again in a little while, write the papers and the grants. As um, I'm sure Dr. Chamberlain said, until it's published, it's not research. Uh, don't get trapped into too much service. Uh, what I have found in my years in, in, in administration is young faculty are really passionate. They want to make the world a better place, and you get frequently drawn into service activities and a lot of effort with teaching. It's important. 
but get your research on track first before you get pulled into those other areas because it's really difficult to get back. If you have teaching responsibilities, don't let them distract from your research. And that's really hard to do because students are people, if you have kids of your own, you, you want somebody to be good to your kids, so you want to be good to students. But try to keep, at least at the beginning, your research as your primary um, goal, and then the teaching can come when your research is up and running a little bit better. Seek and listen to good mentors, right? Do your homework, see who's in your field, and when you get connected with them, listen to what they have to say. Um, the last thing I learned is to read, read, read. Um, you can't read enough. Read people in your field who write well. That's one of the best ways to help you write well. Uh, but don't give up reading just because your dissertation or your master's project is, is over. Keep reading with the literature. And then the last thing I learned is the beauty of the uh, School of Pub the Public Health accreditation. Um, I was at UB when we were becoming a School of Public Health, and we all pulled our hair out over the CEF objectives and mapping out our courses. And uh, I learned very quickly in my next position how absolutely critical those objectives are. And they're there for a really important reason. So Act Two took me to a place that I absolutely never thought I would go, and that's um, at the CDC, where I was the Physical Activity and Health Branch Chief. And I went there because um, it was just too good of an opportunity to pass up, and I, w I, I felt we knew enough about physical activity being beneficial, but we don't have enough people doing it. And so this would give me an opportunity to lead an entire branch with the task of making all Americans get the physical activity they need for health. Learned a lot there, very different kinds of research. It was more about surveillance. And you know, when I took Epi 101, I learned that there's surveillance and there's other type of research. But when you're realizing that surveillance has very different methods and that sometimes you can't always ask what you want to ask, because for the last 10 years they've asked something a certain way, you learn to be very careful and selective with what kinds of databases that you use and you create. Um, I did learn about research, but not as much. It was really much more practice and translating research to practice. Also learned a lot about communicating, communicating to the public. Very different than writing a research paper or doing a research seminar. I learned about training young people, and this is where I really got firsthand experience about the lens on health equity and what health equity really means. So one of the first projects I worked on um, was this document called Strategies to Increase Physical Activity Among Youth. And this was um, a really interesting experience. We had a deadline, and our deadline was not your typical deadline. Our deadline was a pending election. And this work was supported by the Obama administration, and we knew if he did not win the election, our work was going to end up on the floor somewhere in HHS. And so we used a review of reviews methodology, and we published this document of proven strategies to get our youth to be more physically active. It was a very different experience, uh, working with a team of experts in all different areas, all different settings. And then we put together a communication piece, which is really a one-pager that takes this massive document and in one page becomes a practical communication piece for schools, for physicians, for scientists, uh, for parents, and for uh, community organizations. So very different type of work than, than etiologic research. I also had the privilege of being part of um, this Vital Signs, where we wrote a, a morbidity and mortality weekly article. And Vital Signs is something that CDC publishes once a month about an area that they feel is essential and critical to public health. In 2012, this was the first time they ever produced a Vital Signs on anything related to physical activity. And so we had data on walking. Simple question, how, how much did people walk in 2010? How much did they walk in 2015? Well, when I got there, I wanted to multivariate adjust and look at all these different layers. Well, you can't do that with surveillance data. You can look at what it was in one year, and you can look at it what it was in another, and you can kind of control for the, for the populations. But we had a really simple message. Americans were really walking more. But there was a, another problem. Too many were still inactive. About half of adults at that point got the minimum recommended guidelines. And more people were walking, 
but how much they were walking really depended on where they lived, their health, and their age. And so we came to the conclusion that if we want to increase walking, we need to take a community approach and that people need safe, convenient, attractive places to walk. It's very different for me. I'm going now from classic etiologic research to starting to look at what are communities doing? How many sidewalks do they have? Do they have complete streets policies? What do they do to promote walking? And so um, I was very lucky again uh, because at that point Regina Benjamin was the Surgeon General and she wanted to do something about physical activity. And I still remember the day we met with her and I sat down and I said, well, we, we want to do walking. And she looked at me and she said, pardon me? I said, yeah, we, we want to promote walking. It's, it's what people do most. Everybody can do it. Any changes we make for people to walk will make it easier for moms with strollers, people in wheelchairs, uh, elderly with walkers. We want to do walking. And she stopped and she goes, you know what? Let's do it. Let's do it. Well, it was a battle because, you know, there's nothing very sexy about the U.S. government telling people to walk more. But what really happened was we had two-prong approach, one to encourage individuals, but the one that really hit and is still continuing now is the, the making it safer and easier for everyone to walk. Why was it important? Because it had many co-benefits besides physical activity. Cities' crime rates could drop. Traffic accidents could be reduced. Air pollution could be reduced. Economics could increase. And so we took a simple thing like walking and individual behavior for health and made the whole intervention focused on communities and things that they could do from a small budget to a large budget. So I was very lucky to spend uh, several years, it actually finished after I left, working with Regina and then eventually uh, acting uh, Surgeon General Boris Lushniak to, promote, to produce a Surgeon General's call to action on walking in walkable communities. And um, the lessons learned from this is a, a document like this and a movement like this has spun into many other areas uh, to the point now where there are federal transportation dollars that have been appropriated towards walking. It used to be, let's keep people moving in their cars, let's get some subways going, but now the, the budget has changed to promote things to make it easier for people to walk. And so, lots of supporting actors here, but they're really different. The President of the United States, obviously, without endorsing it in Congress, we wouldn't have the money, we wouldn't have had the blessing to go forward with this. Um, state and local departments of health, these are the implementers. These are the people who are going to take this work and, and publish it. Um, luckily, HHS and other federal agencies backed us. Uh, we had national state surveillance systems because one of the critical things about promoting walking is how are you going to know if you've made any difference? And so if there aren't national surveillance tools that look at these things, this document would have never gotten off the ground. Um, and then national organizations. What you see on the right is a brochure. It was started by Kaiser Permanente, um, and there were over 100 different groups who had different reasons to promote walking. And when Regina Benjamin retired, because of the national partnerships, because of the advocacy, because of the motion that was in place and their voice, there was no way they wouldn't go forward with this document. So your community partners are going to be also critical to the success of your work. What did I learn? Do something you love. I learned about a surveillance research. I learned about op outstanding opportunities for MPH graduates. If you are an MPH student and you're interested in going to CDC, go to their website. There's wonderful opportunities for people with an MPH degree. I also learned to write in plain language. You know, you sit down and you write that. My hypothesis is that there may be an association inversely related to while adjusting for to be able to say walking's good for you, right? It's really a task to write in plain language to get your message clear. I learned a lot about practice and program evaluation. If that's an area that you're interested in, um, there is a great cancer center at, at CDC. Sometimes it gets overshadowed by NIH, but they do really good practitioner work. Um, I learned that you speak for the voice of the agency. So sometimes you can't say or the, what you want to say or the way you want to say it because you are representing the United States of America. And that for me, as a scientist who felt pretty 
safe to say what I wanted was, was a real learning lesson. And I also learned to be really flexible. The call to action we worked on for over two years, we sat down step by step with Regina, and then about three months before we were ready to produce it, they said, we don't like the format, change it. So you talk about glitches and, and barriers, it got completely revised in a very, very different format. Uh, but you just plug ahead and, and make it work. So Act 3 is here. This is our Walk with the Future doc. By the way, those of you who walk, we walked 2,300 steps. There were 13 of us, so collectively 29,900 steps. I haven't lost some of my epi skills. Um, and so I came back here because I miss students. Um, it, it was a great opportunity to be part of building a brand new school, uh, the seven-year BSMD program that Dr. Solar talked about, um, and then to be part of the, the Department of Community Health and Social Medicine, where a major focus was on the social determinants of health. And so taking that community initiative, uh, looking at, at the factors that make it difficult for people to make the easy choice. You know, when I was in Atlanta uh, and I would go back after a while, they'd say, well, you're in New York City, everybody walks there. Everybody walks here because they have to. But how many of you have been on the subway since you came here? Any of you see a mom with a stroller carrying the stroller up the stairs? Right? That, that's not an uncommon happening. I don't know if any of you took the one and you had to walk up the, the street. The sidewalk is a mess. It's not well lit. So there are a lot of ways we can improve uh, making walking for, for um, people even in a city like New York. So coming here gave me that opportunity. Lots of supporting actors here, our students, been very fortunate to work within and across CUNY, other institutions. Uh, was just thrilled when Dr. Solomon joined, joined our team here. Um, and it, it's been a, just an absolute pleasure to work with him and to meet all of you. Um, you can see here a number of the different organizations that I've had the opportunity to work with, some of them through the Walk with the Doc program, others through research opportunities. Uh, but the first thing I did here um, was, was go out and meet a lot of people from a lot of different groups in that first year. And so what is my lessons learned? Do something you love. The happiest days for me are when I can work with our students. Um, I learned about medical school accreditation, a little different from public health. Also learned about strategic planning because we were in the process of building a brand new school. We were in the process of building a brand new department. And I also learned I can live in New York City. So those of you who went over um, to, to foreign countries, I applaud you. For me, it was a big deal moving from Buffalo to Atlanta to New York City. But uh, my daughter gave me six months, and I've been here five years. So I'm proud of you. So in summary, I have been really lucky. I have had great teachers like Dr. Michaelick and great mentors. I have had brilliant colleagues. I have had outstanding students. I have extremely generous study participants. And I have been lucky to be able to teach, conduct research, and practice at, at the individual and the community and the national level. And so to echo Dr. Michael, there's a lot of luck involved. And you got to see it and take advantage of it. So my final thoughts, pursue something you love. Create your own research niche. Make yourself that go-to person in your field so that people start to recognize you as something that you're doing that they need that they want to collaborate with. Get out and network. Keep an open mind because you never know when opportunities will become, come before you. And the last thing we touched on a little bit, strive for work-life balance. Because if you're in this for the long haul, you need to keep yourself healthy, you need to make time for yourself, take time for your family. And I think in this field today, that's going to be your biggest challenge. So make sure you make time for yourselves. And so thank you for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm all